Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop, where today we're going to build this English garden bench made of teak. Now, it looks like an ambitious project, and it is, but I know you can do it, and I'm going to show you how. Coming up next, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. Well, I didn't have the nerve to wear my plaid shirt here in London, and as you can see, I left my tool belt back at the shop. But I thought it would be the perfect place to find an authentic English garden bench. How's this one over here? A perfect example. Originally, they were made from English oak, but when all those trees were cut down, they went to teak, a perfect choice in this damp English weather. <laughs> now, if I can only find my tape measure, we could copy it. Before we get started, I'd like to reassure you that if you'd like to build an exact copy of today's project, that a measure drawing and a materials list are available. And you'll hear more about that before this program ends. Now I'd like to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your tools. Knowing how to use your tools safely greatly reduces the possibility of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now I'll show you how I built today's project. Boy, that is tough stuff. Teak. And when it came time to build our garden bench, what other choice would there be? Especially after seeing how all those garden benches held up so well for decades without any maintenance. Now it's expensive, and you're going to have to search around for it, but it's well worth it. I managed to find some rough teak and plane it down myself. And I learned a couple things about teak. It drills, saws, and sands beautifully. It's very predictable. But to plane it for thickness, it dulls planer blades quicker than you would believe. What I found out from reading in one of my wood books was that it contains silica, and that might be one of the reasons that it dulls the blade so quickly. Now, to get started on our project, I want to cut these shaped pieces, the curves in the front leg, the armrest, the back leg and backrest, which is angled, and curved at the top. So over here on my lumber rack, I have all the teak that I need to build the bench cut approximately to the right size. And this piece has been laid out for one of the front legs. It's straight and then curved up at the top. I'm going to use my bandsaw to make the cuts. And I've set it up with a quarter inch blade. The reason I want to use a quarter inch blade is that some of the radius or the curves are fairly tight. And the narrower the blade, the easier it is to cut the curves. Now also, this particular cut runs straight for about 20 inches, and then it curves. So I've set up a rip fence to cut the straight portion. And when I reach the curve, I'll slide the fence out of the way and finish the cut. Cuts just like butter, or at least hard cheese. It's very predictable. And now I'll cut another one of these. Well, the next piece to cut are these armrests. I need two of these. It's the same thickness stock as the front leg was, but the layout is a little different. It's almost totally curved, no straight portions. And look at this piece. It has kind of an interesting grain effect right here, which I'm going to leave so they can see that when it's finished. Now, I have to cut this all freehand, no rip fence. And what I like to do is just eyeball it. I want to get the blade so that it just leaves the line. And I don't want to make any mistakes at the price of this stuff. The next piece to make is this back leg backrest piece. And to make it, I need a piece of timber four by six. Now, for those of you concerned where this teak comes from, 
I've been assured by my supplier that it was plantation grown, specifically for making projects like this, not stripped from a rainforest. Now this piece has the angles and a curved top, and I can't really use my rip fence to help me, so I'm going to have to cut it all freehand. So I'm just going to take my time back at the bandsaw. Well, despite the fact that there are no intersecting joints on the back of this member, I still have to sand it smooth. I can't use the joiner, but I can use my belt sander. And I've clamped both of the members in the vise, and I'll just sand them together nice and smooth. All right, both of those surfaces line up pretty well. And now to finish off any areas that I couldn't do on the joiner or the belt sander, like these curves, these tight curves, I'm going to use my drill press, which is outfitted with this little drum sander. And I've put some 100 grit paper on it. Well, that does a great job. And I'll use the drum sander for the rest of the parts as well. All the joinery on the bench is made with mortise and tenons. Here's a tenon, the corresponding mortise, and down here another mortise with the corresponding tenon. And we choose this type of joinery because it's with a little bit of glue and some dowels, it's extremely strong. Now what I had to do first though was to lay out all the mortises very carefully on each piece following the plan and double checking them before I start to clean them out. Now to clean them out, I'm using my drill press set up with a 3 quarter inch Forstner bit. And that'll give me a nice flat bottom. Here's where this mortise wants to be. And the depth is set on the drill press so that it doesn't go all the way through. It'll stop at a predetermined depth. The idea is to remove as much material as possible with the bit so that I'll have less work chiseling it out later. Well, now it's time for some hand work. I need a 3 quarter inch chisel and a 1 inch chisel. And this is the part of the job that takes some time, patience, and sharp tools. First thing I want to do is remove these little ridges. And I really don't even need a mallet. A nice sharp chisel, you can just shave it right down. You know, this teak, it cuts so beautifully. I can't believe that just with a chisel and hand pressure, I can just shave it away. Now I'll switch to my 3 quarter inch chisel. I'm using a 3 quarter inch chisel because it's exactly the same width as my mortise. And I'll chisel out the remaining corners. Well, that looks pretty good. Only 19 more to go. Well, with all the mortises cut in the end members, I'm now ready to start working on the tenons, the part that fits into the mortise on this bottom rail and on this piece up here, which is the top rail and the seat support. And I'll do that over on the table saw. Well, over here, I've attached a guide block to the rip fence, and I'm going to use my miter gauge to push the stock through. Now, I've set it up so that the distance from the guide block to the outside edge of the blade is inch and a half, the length of my tenon. And the height of the blade has been set to 3 eighths of an inch depth, the amount of material I want to remove. The next thing I want to do is make this shoulder cut right here. I don't have to change the fence, but I do have to lower the blade, and I'll use my prototype piece as a gauge. That should do it, and now I'll run all the pieces through. Well, that's one way to make these cheek cuts, just using the saw blade and nibbling away at it. 
It's time consuming, but it's fairly accurate. Now I'm going to show you another way to make those cheek cuts. Now this is a tenoning jig made by the manufacturer of this saw. Every manufacturer has their own version. Now this one rides in the same slot as the miter gauge. It's heavy cast iron. It's very well built. And what it does is it allows you to hold pieces of wood in a vertical position, clamping them quickly with this clamp and cutting very accurate tenons. But best of all, it's very safe. I've just removed the material along the narrow side of the tenon. Now I could nibble that away or I could use a hand saw to remove the material, but the band saw is just quicker. Have a look at the seat braces here in the middle and these end rails. They have a slight curve downward to give the seat a nice gentle look. And I've traced the outline on my rail and that's another job for the bandsaw. Now it takes care of smoothing out that cut. Now I just want to dry fit the pieces together. This rail goes into that mortise. And we take the front leg and that slips on here. Now there's a couple more tenons that I have to make. I need one at the top of the front leg and the mortise from the bottom of the armrest goes over that. And I need another tenon at the back of the armrest and that fits into this mortise on the back of the rest. Now to cut these, I could cut them with the band saw, I could cut them by hand, or I could cut them with the table saw. But since I have a radial arm, I've set it up with a dado head cutter to just nibble away the material. Now that takes care of that side of the tenon. Now on the other side of the armrest is the corresponding angle. And in order to cut that, I'm going to have to swing my radial arm 12 and a half degrees on the other side of zero. And I'll make sure that I keep the straight edge of the armrest up against the fence. The tenon that's at the top of the front leg is cut the same way. And now I just have to trim up the tenons using the bandsaw. Let's look back at our prototype again. In some cases where the mortises are at the same height, they intersect one another. And the tenons would hit each other unless I mitered them in the corners like this. So I'm going to use my power miter box to make that cut. I want to round over the top edge of this armrest so that it isn't sharp. I'll go along the top and come around and stop right about here because I don't want to go where my joint is. And to round that over, I'll simply use my router, which is set up with a half inch rounding over bit. Before I start my assembly, I have mixed up some waterproof glue. And that might seem like an extreme, but I want to use this as a precaution so that this bench is going to stay together forever. It's a two-part mix. There's a resin and a catalyst. And once you put the two together and mix them up, you end up with a glue, once it's dried, that's impervious to water, insects, and even chemicals. Now, it's a little messy, so you have to be careful using it. You can clean it up with water before it dries. And what you want to do is just use a brush and spread a little bit in the joints. 
You don't need very much because the joinery is fairly tight. Now put a little bit of glue on the tenon. Now I can just slip the joint together. And in a minute, I'll put a dowel in to hold it all together. I'll wipe off any of that excess glue before it dries. Now these clamps are really made just to hold the pieces tightly together and square while I drill for dowels. Now for those dowels, I'm going to use a 3 8 inch brad point bit. And I've set up a collar here so I don't go all the way through the piece. I do want to go far enough through, though, so that I go through the tenon and into the other side of the mortise so it'll lock everything together. OK, now I'm just going to take a nail and just put a little bit of this waterproof glue on it. And just dab a little inside the hole so that when I drive the dowel in, it'll get glued and it won't pop out later. Now for a dowel, 3 8 inch birch dowel. And I'll trim the excess off later. Now that takes care of the excess dowel that was sticking up. Note that I've removed the clamps. They're no longer necessary. The dowels will hold it together while the glue sets up. Now, those assemblies are joined together by a series of rails. The back has a top rail and a bottom rail with slats in between. And out front here, there's another rail at the front edge of the seat. Each rail fits into a mortise. So I need a tenon at the end of each rail, and I'll cut those over on the table saw like I did with the side rails. Now, this is a piece of 2 by 3 which is the bottom rail of the back. And using my guide block and my T-square, I'll make the shoulder cuts first. Well, I could finish off the tenon by nibbling it away, I suppose. But since I have enough height here in the shop and I've got my tenoning jig, this is the way to do it. Well, now I have to trim the narrow side of the tenon. And again, I could cut it by hand, but why waste the bandsaw when it's right here in the shop? In order for this back rail to fit into this mortise correctly, I'm going to have to miter the corner so that it'll intersect the miter of the other tenon. And I'll do that over here on my miter box. Now these are the two back rails. And I've laid out a series of mortises into which these slats will fit. They just float in there. They're not attached with any mechanisms or glue. And I could drill them out and chisel them by hand like I did on the prototype. But I want to show you this attachment for my drill press. It's a mortising attachment. And it comes with this fence. And then there's a bracket here which holds the wood down so as you lift the chisel out, it doesn't lift up. And there's a yoke right here into which fits a square chisel. And then you slide a drill bit into that. And as the drill press pushes down, the drill will start the hole, and the chisel will square it up. It's very quick, and it's accurate. Now the first piece I want to work on is the top rail where the mortises go straight down. Boy, that works great. You know, when I did the other one by hand, it took me almost an hour to make the same number of mortises that I just did in 10 minutes. Now for a difficult part of the project, but a nice refinement for our garden bench. This bottom rail runs parallel to the lower portion of the leg here, as well as the top rail runs parallel to the backrest slant. Now, I suppose I could twist this bottom rail so that the mortises for the slats would be straight in. But this little turn back down gives a lot of refinement to the project, but it means a little bit more work. 
Now what I have to do is figure out a way to drill the mortises at a 12 and a half degree angle, which is the same as the angle we used on the armrest. So I've cut some wedges, one that sits in the bottom, that's 12 and a half degrees, another one in the back, another one in the front. And what happens is the piece sits in like this, the mortising machine works straight down, yet it's setting the mortise at a 12 and a half degree angle. And I'll do it the same way I did the top rail. Now I just want to round over the top of this top rail along the back, and the only thing I need to do that is a half inch round over bit set up in my router. Okay, let's assemble it. No dowels, no glue. Friction will take care of it. Well, this is a time you could use the help of 16 of your closest personal friends, one for every slat. But be patient, you'll get it all together. Bench has two intermediate supports with tenons that fit into mortises along the front rail. I'll cut that mortise next, and I'll use my drill press with the mortising attachment, except this time I won't use the fence, I'll just cut it freehand. Now I need to cut a tenon on the end of those intermediate supports to fit into those mortises. That's good. Now what I have to do is cut a notch in the other end of the piece where it meets the back rail, like this. And now the curve. Well, now it's time to assemble the bench. A little more waterproof glue on the tenons. I've already put some in the mortises. So now I should just be able to carefully slip these together and drive them down with my mallet. Now this is the front rail. I'll slip that in this mortise. Now a little glue in the mortises of the other arm. This waterproof glue is great stuff, but you gotta get it off, any excess off, with a wet rag before it hardens or you'll never get it off. Good. Now let's see if the other side fits on there. Well, as before, we'll pin it all together with some glue and some dowels. A little bit of glue on the tenon of this center support, and we'll slip that into the mortise. Now I'm just going to drill a hole down through the top and pin it with a dowel. Now here on the bottom side, where only the chipmunks are going to see it, I think I'll fasten this member with a screw because it'll hold better. Well, now we're ready for the seat. The first slat to go on is this front one, and basically it's even with the leg. Now the back slat just butts up against the backrest. 
Now for the center three slats, I just use this little spacer block to just space them out equally. Now to fill these little counter bore holes, I've got a little trick. What I have here set up in my drill press is a plug cutter. It's really a bit that has a hollow core and it'll bore out these little plugs. So I've taken a piece of teak to match the rest of the project and after they're bored, you just take a screwdriver and you pop them out. You end up with a nice little teak plug. You bring it over, dab a little bit of the waterproof glue on the bottom edge and fill the hole. I'll drive it down with my mallet. I'll trim it flush, sand it down, and it'll blend in perfectly with the rest of the project. Well, there it is. I wonder what it'll look like out in the garden. After sitting out in the weather for a couple months, this is what your teak garden bench should look like. Now, if you enjoyed building this, here are some of the other new Yankee projects that you can build right in your own home workshop. Here's a workbench, a useful item in any shop. This is a drop leaf table, a classic addition to any home. Here is a blanket chest, a wonderful heirloom piece to build and have. The bedside table is shaker inspired and a popular piece. Take a look at the bathroom vanity. Its design draws on the dry sinks of the past. This handsome trestle table is patterned after one found on the island of Nantucket. The bookcase, a revival of an old beauty found at Sturbridge Village. The chest of drawers is a traditional piece based on a shaker design. Look at the candle stand with its beautifully turned center column and gently curving legs. Here is a hutch, an indispensable item in any kitchen or dining room. My writing desk is made of maple with a smooth writing surface and lots of useful storage compartments. The corner cupboard makes good use of those often unused areas in your home. Here's a medicine cabinet made from oak and featuring box joints. This child's rocking horse is fashioned after one we found at Old Sturbridge Village. Made of ash, it features a heart-shaped saddle. Here's the Adirondack chair, a popular piece of outdoor furniture. This one is built of cypress wood and needs no preservatives. The elegant mahogany butler's table has four leaves which fold down on solid brass hinges. The kitchen cupboard is a useful piece, good for storing dishes, books, and foodstuffs. Made of pine, it features open shelves above and a base cabinet below. This curved hearthside settle is a unique piece, useful beside a fireplace or in a hallway. It also features a storage compartment. How about this pencil post bed with its eight-sided bed post made of poplar? It's a graceful piece of furniture. Look at this chair table, a comfortable and serviceable piece. It features a tabletop that pivots back to form a backrest and a seat with a drawer underneath. This kitchen work table is built of poplar and cherry and it also functions well as a dining room table. Here is the mission style sofa, inspired by one from the Craftsman era. It's made of solid oak and includes mortise and tenon joinery. With this mahogany Chippendale mirror, I'll demonstrate how best to use a trimmer and clamps to get the best results for frames of any type. This chest on chest is designed after one we found at historic Deerfield. Made of cherry, it features contoured feet and dovetail joinery. For a real classic, you'll want to build this teak garden bench, assembled entirely with mortise and tenon joinery and pegs, it will last forever.
The Entertainment Center is a project based on a couple classic designs, but adapted to modern day uses. Built with cherry and plywood, it's sure to become a favorite. And that's the new Yankee collection. Norm Abram is the author of the book, The New Yankee Workshop, which is available in bookstores and libraries nationwide.